and I'm, yeah, thrilled to be here, and it's my first scale. I'm honored to be presenting to you today, so, yeah. Uh, I have an intro slide I'll get to in a second, but today I'll be presenting self-healing clusters, game of nodes, and scaling the throne. It's kind of some horrible wordplay, but might resonate with some of you. Um, yeah, mostly talking about a couple different open source projects that we can um, dig into to understand how to make more resilient, stable Kubernetes environments. And uh, yeah, just feel free to interrupt me at any point if you have questions. A um, little bit about me. Uh, I've been working hands-on with Kubernetes and Go since 2019. Um, I'm in charge of Spectral Cloud's advanced projects team, so I like getting hands-on with all the latest Kubernetes tech, building POCs, and also working on our back end. And when I'm not doing that, I try to get outside and play with rocks. Um, yeah, that's me. Feel free to connect on LinkedIn. So today, I'll just go over some of the challenges that people face, um, you know, what makes clusters unstable and common pitfalls, and then talk about the heroes of the story, these three open source projects, and then we'll have a demo and maybe there will be a shameless plug at the end. Um, we'll see. All right, so the challenge is at hand. <coughs> Basically, um, stability is key, and as everyone knows, with Kubernetes getting more and more traction, we are now seeing you know production-grade workloads that are running mission-critical software in a couple different categories. So AI, ML use cases are big. Video streaming, you know, we have gaming platforms um, running in production medical imaging, um, and when you have that kind of a situation, you really don't want any downtime. Um, and also, we basically are seeing a proliferation of clusters, of, you know, bigger clusters, more clusters, more stuff going on as the ecosystem explodes. I don't know the last time you looked at the CNCF landscape um, poster, but, you know, there's just so much to choose from, and it le leads to just increasing management complexity and, and growth pains. Um, and with that being the case, you know, how can we prevent service outages and um, degradations? And there's a few simple things we can do. So, you know, a lot of the time you look in an environment and you realize that every single pod is receiving the best effort quality of service because people don't necessarily even know about quality of service. And um, that just relates to whether or not pods have specified resources um, and or limits. So there's three different quality of service quality of service classes, uh, guaranteed, burstable, and best effort. But in a situation where everything's receiving best effort, quality of service, and you start encountering node pressure, then anything could get evicted. So if you want a stable environment, you you probably should be delineating what's ne what needs a higher quality of service versus what maybe not might not be so mission critical. Um, so that's just like one very brief example of something to be aware of. And I guess, you know, I'll just dig into it a little bit more, which is that you'll, if you specify limits and requests for a pod and they equal one another, you'll receive what's called guaranteed. And then if you specify at least um, a memory request or a memory limit, that'll be considered burstable. And then um, best effort means you just didn't specify anything. And then when there's node pressure and things start getting evicted by the kubelet, you will be evicted sooner if you're in the best effort category. And, there's lots of things that get taken into consideration, but that's just one of them. Um, okay, so what else makes a cluster unstable? Really, when you start thinking about stability, you have to understand uh, pod eviction and pod preemption, and who's doing that when. Um, so when node resources get low, aka node pressure, um, the kubelet will start evicting pods. And when it does that, it takes into consideration things like priority, um, quality of service, and many other things. Um, pod preemption, on the other hand, is where um, if you have nodes that have filled up and the scheduler is trying to place additional workload, uh, it needs to make decisions about how it's gonna do that. It may evict um, running workloads that have, that have already been online because there's a new workload that needs to be scheduled and it might have a higher priority. So priority gets taken into consideration with preemption as well. And you know, there's a bunch of different stuff in the cluster that you can configure to impact the types of decisions that get made by the kubelet and the scheduler um, when you're running into a resource crunch. So some of that um, I've already touched on, but 
understanding priority is and priority classes is you know a good place to start. Um, by default, everything is going to receive the same priority, but you can assign a priority class name to any pod and then associate that to the there's a integer valued priority that is associated with the class, and you're in a you know ideal world segregating your workload based on um, how important it is to you and defining a higher priority to workload that you don't want to be preempted. Um, and then resource quotas, they're a uh, double-edged sword, so they're important because you might be in multi-tenant, you might be operating multi-tenant Kubernetes clusters. Um, a common pattern is like to have a team per namespace or you might be running third-party workloads, um, you know, truly multi-tenant cluster. And in that case, you want to prevent noisy neighbors, you know, you want to ensure that namespaces are receiving a specific amount of capacity and you do that with a resource quota. So you can define the total number of objects like config maps, services, secrets that can be provisioned in a namespace. Also, you can dictate the total um, CPU requests, memory requests, storage, et cetera. Um, but in order for resource quotas to be imp implemented, you need every pod to define requests. And if it doesn't, it won't get scheduled. So this is another common pitfall, is like a, an application developer is trying to apply a resource into a cluster, and an administrator has applied a resource quota into the namespace that they're trying to schedule their pod into, and it's not getting scheduled, and they don't know why, and it's because they haven't defined um, limits, or they've just exceeded uh, what's available, and then that can take time to debug. And that's where limit ranges come into play. You can create a limit range, which is a namespace resource, which will define defaults that will be auto-assigned to every container um, in every pod that gets scheduled in that namespace. But that's also you know, not necessarily ideal. Like It's a good catch-all to ensure that you're tracking everything and defining resources and limits, but you also probably don't want the defaults all the time, so it's something to be aware of. Um, and then network policies, that another double-edged sword. If there are um, constraints around which pods should be talking to which other pods, then network policies are how you do that, because the default in Kubernetes is everything and everyone can talk to everything else, which is fine in dev, but uh, if you're trying to achieve any sort of segregation, then you end up implementing these, and anyone who's uh, dealt with a misconfigured network policy might know that they can be kind of tricky to debug, and when things stop talking to each other because some policy change, that, you know, that's gonna lead to instability. Um, stateful applications, I could talk about this whole talk, so I'll just gloss over it, but you know, if you're doing things wrong, um, you're gonna lose data, and there's entire solutions that I would recommend you probably look at, because if you wanna roll your own in-house, you have to understand snapshot controller, backing up your persistent volumes, um, best practices around stateful sets. Um, there are to, you know, paid tools like Portworx that do a good job there, um, and open source solutions, but the long and short of it is, um, if you have a stateful app and you haven't configured some of these other things and it gets evicted, then you're in trouble. Um, lastly, logging and monitoring. This one's just obvious. You need to know what's happening in your cluster and by default, Kubernetes doesn't have a cluster level logging solution. So a vanilla Kubernetes cluster, you're gonna lose logs over time. Not everything's retained. When a pod gets killed, um, the logs for the totality of its lifespan are lost unless you're aggregating somewhere upstream. So. Um, yeah, and then one last thing is just that resource quotas can be scoped, and that relates to priority classes. This is just um, getting a little bit deeper. If you want to be defining quotas in a namespace, but you don't want to be um, applying those quotas equally to all the workloads, you can stratify it by priority class, for example. Um, so that's another kind of more advanced usage with resource quotas. Okay, so now what can we start to talk about for how to achieve stability? Um, node problem detector is one of our three heroes that we'll, we'll talk about shortly. Um, but what it does is, at a high level, is performs real-time real health checks of low-level processes that would normally fall beneath the kind of observability of the Kubernetes control plane. Um, and it can be useful to understand the health of things like the container runtime um, that you're running on your nodes, uh, the kubelet, and, and other things. And you can surface events and node conditions which would tie into other um, alerting systems or even automated remediation systems. Uh, and then for topology management, there's a whole suite of, of different solutions. Um, 
cluster autoscaler, vertical pod autoscaler, and cluster proportional autoscaler all fall under the um, open the Kubernetes parent project, the autoscaling, you know, sub project within Kubernetes. And I'll be talking about cluster autoscaler a fair bit, but I'll just touch on these others first. So a, a hint, if you're trying to understand your workload, is to use vertical pod autoscaler with the off mode. So it has four modes. And by default, like its auto mode is it'll actually adapt your workload based on the resources um, being consumed. But that's an actual that's actually a, like a disruptive behavior because if your initial spec is not in alignment with what's being consumed, like maybe if you're running a Java app and uh, it's using a lot of memory, then uh, it'll actually get bounced. So the like the API server will resize the deployment, and it'll be it'll do a rolling replacement. So there's downtime potentially, which is disruptive. Um, so I have a link here, and I can share these slides later. But there's an open pull request to take advantage of a new Kubernetes feature as of version 1.27, which is in-memory um, vertical pod scaling. So basically, the ability to patch the um, sorry online pa patching of uh, CPU and memory specifications without having to do a rolling replacement of that workload. Um, and you can, yeah, like I mentioned, you can run VPA in off mode, and it'll purely generate recommendations for how to size your workload, but it won't actually do anything disruptive. So that can be a good way to, if you're trying to figure out how to right size the things you have in your cluster, you can do that. Um, the recommendations will just show up in the status field of the resource, and you can pull that out later and then subsequently change your manifest. Um, Keta is another thing that if I'm giving a talk about Kubernetes scaling, I kind of have to mention. So it stands for Kubernetes Event Driven Auto Scaling, and it's also a whole talk unto itself. But it basically builds off of the horizontal pod auto scaler, which is a, like a native a Kubernetes primitive and allows you to scale based off of external metrics. It also can perform behavior, like it has scalers that relate to internal cluster state, but primarily it integrates with dozens of external systems like AWS, um, all the public clouds. For instance, like a uh, SQSQ, um, you might want to scale based off of the like queue length metric. And it supports scaling to zero, which is cool. So if there's no messages in that queue, you can bring your deployment down to zero replicas and then bring it back up accordingly. Um, then with regard to internal scalers, there's two worth mentioning, which are the Prometheus scaler and the Cron scaler. So Keta can basically just scale workloads based on a fixed cron schedule, which if you're trying to operate workloads on a particular, um, you know, follow the sun model or what have you, then that can, that can be useful. And then the Prometheus scale will let you scale using cluster internal Prometheus metrics. Um, so that's Keta. Um, Cluster proportional autoscaler is in beta. Um, it's kind of an interesting concept, though. It's basically you take a fixed allocation for a workload, and then as the cluster size changes, then the number of replicas for that workload and also the requests that they um, have will be scaled out proportionally. So if it had uh, basically a request for one CPU and there was one node in the cluster, and then you added a second node, it would go down to half a CPU, um, and there would be two replicas, one on each node. So it's kind of an interesting comp concept, but uh, it's in beta. And then the other final uh, building block is descheduler, which is one of our other three heroes, so we'll hear a lot more about it. Um, is anyone here familiar with vSphere DRS? Yeah, so <laughs> distributed resource scheduler. I would say that descheduler is basically analogous to DRS. Um, a lot of people come to Kubernetes and they're wondering why there isn't a solution to automatically rebalance uh, workload, and that's where descheduler shines. All right, a few more building blocks. So policy enforcement, another big change with Kubernetes. Not so recently, but in, as of version 1.25, they deprecated pod security uh, policies in lieu of, well, now the new thing is pod security admission and pod security standards. But they're sort of woefully insufficient for any advanced use cases. There's three buckets. Um, Baseline, privileged, and restricted. So privileged is anything goes. Um, restricted is you can barely do anything. And then there's sort of a midline option. But um, this doesn't 
meet the needs of a lot of enterprises. So what they end up doing is just disabling this completely and then going with a policy as code solution like Caverno, OPA, JS policy. I'm a big fan of Loft Labs. That's why I threw in JS policy, but it's um, not as mature as the other two. I would recommend Caverno if you aren't already using Rego, which is what OPA uses. Caverno is the most kind of Kubernetes native and it's not quite as uh, mature as OPA, but it doesn't require using Rego, so that's nice. Um, but these just allow you to define very granular access control policies via um, webhooks, and it's just way more granular than pod security standards. Um, logging and observability, this, you know, Everyone knows about Prometheus and Grafana, I think, or if not, I'm sorry, um, but it's very common. Um, and you, you need cluster level logging, like I mentioned on the previous slide. FluentD is an open source project that does a great job of that with the sidecar model, basically uploading all the metrics for all of your pods to a central uh, location for querying. Um, if you don't know what's happening when your pods are dying or things are crashing, then you won't be able to debug anything. So. That's something that's mandatory in production. And then if you think you're doing everything right, or at least you think you're doing a pretty good job and you want to understand whether you're able to actually live up to the SLOs that you that you claim to provide, you might want to start playing with chaos engineering. Um, chaos Mesh is a project in that space that can basically just break things in your cluster. Um, <laughs> it can simulate node failures, uh, take workloads offline at random, um, all sorts of different things. And of course, you'd simultaneously monitor uptime for all of your mission critical services. Uh, okay, on to the heroes of the story. The first one is NPD, um, the node problem detector. This is also within the um, Kubernetes project, so open source and has been seeing more traction recently. Uh, basically, it, it you can install it as a daemon set you can also just run it, it, in some cases it's best to have it running directly on the nodes, but that's a little bit more complicated for provisioning. Uh, although the advantage in that case is that it's not subject to the availability of the container runtime interface, which it's actually monitoring. So it kind of in a lot of senses makes sense to do that, it's just more work. Um, but what it does is it uh, submits events and node conditions to the API server and it also, can export metrics, so it has a concept of exporters. The default or the kind of the main use case would be to export events and node conditions to the API server, but you can also export metrics to Stackdriver and Prometheus. Um, the events are for basically less severe or temporary issues, and then node conditions are interesting because they tie into the, the sort of the, um, synchronicity of these three projects, which we'll talk about shortly, um, but if you set node conditions on nodes, that can inform Descheduler to basically take those nodes or take workload off those nodes and then Cluster Autoscaler can kick in after a certain point and decommission the node completely. Um, so that is node problem detector. And a little bit more about it's, it has a um, plug-in system. So the system log monitor monitors logs on the nodes that where this is running. There's um, a kernel monitor and a container runtime monitor. And one of the example node conditions that would be generated by uh, the kernel monitor would be a kernel deadlock. So basically this just means you have a list of node conditions that you want to set on nodes and you set those conditions when you find logs in certain files matching certain regex patterns. Um, but this can be useful for for instance, detecting that a kernel deadlock happened on a node and then annotating that node uh, with that node condition, which can then allow you to take action upstream and realize that that node needs remediation because um, you might be able to react faster in that, in that case versus just waiting for the node to completely die and the kubelet to stop responding. Um, the health checker monitors the kubelet and the container runtime interface, so, um, Docker or container D, and likewise can produce conditions on the nodes like kubelet unhealthy, container runtime unhealthy. Then there's a custom plugin which allows you to basically just run any shell script you want. Um, and they have an example in their repo for basically indicating that a node has an NTP misconfiguration. 
Um, so it's very flexible. Anything you could do with bash and any condition you want to is the other thing worth mentioning. These are just examples, but you can come up with your own that are meaningful to your own organization. Um, and then lastly, the stats monitor. Um, by default, it just populates uh, metrics that are exposed via a standard Prometheus scrape endpoint, and they're for storage, CPU, memory, all the typical things you'd want to know about the uh, behavior on that node. And they can also be exported to Stackdriver. <coughs> all right, so the second uh, hero of our story is Descheduler. So it's basically DRS uh, for Kubernetes. Uh, or if you're a vSphere fan, you can think of it that way. Um, but what a lot of people don't know is that the scheduler doesn't actually evict pods um, for rebalancing purposes. It just does one-time scheduling up front, and then you get what you get. And in a lot of cases, that's fine if the cluster isn't experiencing any disruptions. But what might happen is that a node goes offline, and you basically have um, all of your workload on, on one of your nodes, and it's way overutilized. And then if you introduce a new node because your original node failed, nothing happens. You're going to have to manually go through the effort of reallocating workload or bouncing pods. So Descheduler will do that for you. Um, this prevents bottlenecks, enhances efficiency, and can save you money. So it has a bunch of different strategies we'll get into because there's different ways you might want to use it. Um, but that's uh, Descheduler in a nutshell. And you can install it like anything else in Kubernetes world. Uh, it has a Helm chart. You can run it in different modes. In the demo, we'll be seeing it running as a cron job. So it runs every one minute. Um, you could just run it continuously, though. So six default policies that ship with Descheduler are here. And then you can also write your own. But these are just sensible defaults that you might get value out of. They're all pretty self-explanatory, but low node utilization means you know Descheduler will detect how busy nodes are, and if it de deems them overutilized, it'll evict pods to try to reduce the utilization. Um, the goal being to balance uh, the workload across the entire cluster. And then high node utilization is the opposite. So you want to detect low. It wants to detect low utilized nodes and then evict workloads off of them to try to bin pack the workload basically. And then that, that ties in with Cluster Autoscaler, because if you have a descheduler configuration of that nature, then Cluster Autoscaler can start taking those nodes offline when there's um, so few pods on them that it determines that it's OK to get rid of them. And then I'm not going to dig into the anti-affinity stuff, but it's there. Um, and then this last one, remove pods violating node taints. This is where the sort of trinity of these solutions comes um, into play. So. Right now, there are limitations, but there's been active work um, on this linked uh, pull request here in the last few months. Basically, what happens today is that uh, the node controller in Kubernetes will only mark a node with the no schedule taint if certain conditions are set, which are sort of the default conditions that are set by the kubelet. So you PID pressure, memory pressure, disk pressure, et cetera. And in that case, if that taint is applied, then descheduler can um, remove pods with the no scheduler, with the no schedule taint, and that's super useful. But um, what we want to do is use NPD to set node conditions that are not the same as these kubelet-based node conditions. We want to talk about you know custom things like a kernel deadlock, and that's not quite ready today, but it should be merged soon. And at that point, we'll be able to leverage these three tools together. And it's not that node problem detector isn't useful today; it just can't specifically be used to achieve that goal. All right, cluster autoscaler. So this um, runs on the Kubernetes control plane, typically in the cube system namespace. And it has um, integrations with all the major clouds. And if we're wanting to do this bin packing thing that I've been talking about, one thing to consider is how you've configured the um, node resources fit plugin for the cube scheduler. By default, it'll use the least allocated strategy. So this is how the cube scheduler decides where to put um, incumbent workload. It'll pick a node that has low utilization. But if you choose most allocated, it'll do the opposite. And then that just basically increases the ag aggressiveness of your strategy for bin packing workloads, because um, descheduler will have to do less work in that case. Um, 
And what it does at a high level is just changes the, sides, the sizes of the node groups that make up your cluster, whether that means adding or removing nodes. And it's configurable through annotations, as well as a lot of other options I'm not going to get into. But um, some of them are good to know about. Like if you want to prevent a node from being taken offline completely, you can give it the scale down disabled annotation. And then pods, likewise, can be protected with the safe to evict true or false annotation. Um, and daemon sets with the enabled DS eviction. And then another thing is the pod um, priority cutoff. So some workloads you might just want cluster autoscaler to disregard completely. And you can do that by setting a priority for those workloads that's beneath the cutoff. And that cutoff is configurable, but it defaults to minus 10. So you'd want to have a priority class of like, you know, cluster autoscaler ignore, set that to minus 15 or whatever. And then you could throw 30 pods with that priority class onto your cluster and cluster autoscaler wouldn't, um, even if some of them are pending, it wouldn't increase the size of the cluster. Um, and how exactly does cluster autoscaler do what it does? Um, well, it depends on whether we're talking about scaling up or down, but with regards to scaling up, it has this concept of an expander and there are a few different strategies for expanders. But the gist of it is if there are any s pending or unschedulable pods in your cluster, then Cluster Autoscaler will try to make a decision about how to add capacity to your one of your node groups. The default is random, so a lot of clusters don't. Well, and also node group isn't like a Kubernetes native concept. There's no like there's no primitive called a, a node group. This is more meaningful with regard to like managed Kubernetes in um, like for instance GKE or AWS. Um, a node group would correspond to an auto scaling group in AWS or uh, a managed instance group in Google. Um, but then it also relates to cluster API, which I'll talk about a bit. But yeah, you can get complicated there, like it's considering price or priority. For instance, if you have like a GPU node group and you want to make sure that new nodes that get scaled out aren't GPUs because you don't want to spend a bunch of money, there's ways to do that. Um, and then Cluster Autoscaler scales down nodes when uh, certain things are true. So all of these things have to stay true for, by default, 10 minutes. You can configure that, that threshold as well. But basically, a node has to have no blocking annotations. It has to have all movable pods. And the sum of all of the resource requests uh, for all of the, the containers and all the pods running on that node has to be below another threshold, which is configurable. and then. For a pod to be movable, that, that ties into pod disruption budgets. So by default, like all the pods running in the cube system namespace are considered un unmovable, unless you've specified a PDB that says, no, actually, it's OK. You can evict these pods. So it can get a little complicated. And you might be in a situation where you're wondering why Cluster Autoscaler won't scale down your node. And these are things to think about. Um, and we'll see a demo of when and why that wouldn't happen. Lastly, yeah, it's compatible with 25 plus cloud providers and cluster API. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, an example um, architecture with cluster API. So for those who aren't familiar, cluster API in a you know nutshell is that you do declarative orchestration and provisioning of Kubernetes clusters from within a Kubernetes cluster using custom resources. So the management cluster is where you would apply these resources, which define the specification for your target clusters that you want to provision. And then there are different cluster API providers for different uh, backends like vSphere or AWS, any, any cloud, any infrastructure provider you can name. There's probably a CAPI provider for that. Um, and so here in this uh, reference architecture, we would use cluster API provider Helm to basically finish off the provisioning process, because one caveat with cluster API is that out of the box, you don't get a fully conformant Kubernetes cluster. You get a cluster that has everything it needs but the CNI, um, which is kind of you, you know, unfortunate. You have to get a CNI in there somehow before you can start scheduling all of your other application workload. That's where the cluster API provider Helm comes in. It's basically an add-on system for cluster API that will allow you to specify Helm charts to put in on top once the cluster comes up. Um, and then you might layer in the rest of your application workload with Argo CD um, via like a GitOps approach. This is just uh, a high-level picture of cluster API. But um, 
cluster autoscaler in this case sits on the management cluster, and that's also configurable. It could be on the workload cluster, or it could be somewhere else completely. But cluster autoscaler really shines with Cappy because you can do things like scale to zero um, and just perform declarative management of you know a whole fleet of workload clusters. And we'll look at a little bit of YAML. Basically, we have a, a deployment for Cluster Autoscaler. And it's in Cube system. And what we have here is uh, the Cube config for a theoretical target cluster, Cappy Dev. And it's mounted as a secret into this Cluster Autoscaler container so that it can talk to that target cluster and understand what's going on within it. And then there's this concept of node group auto discovery. So like, you know, what is a node group? It's not a Kubernetes primitive, but in this case, we're telling cluster API to just um, consider all of the machines within this Cappy dev target cluster as one node group. But that can be more nuanced. You can break it down by labels or namespaces, et cetera. Um, all right, so we have this deployed in the management cluster and all we have to do is add a couple annotations to the corresponding Cappy resource that was reconciled on the management cluster to create the target cluster. So we just define the minimum and maximum size of that cluster, and in this case, one in 10. And there's a bunch of different ways you can define clusters in Cappy, so it could be a machine set deployment or pool, and I won't get into the differences, but basically these are custom resources that define the size of the target cluster and the types of um, nodes that will comprise that cluster. Um, some Cappy providers have native support for scale from zero, um, but even, even if they don't, you can add additional capacity annotations that basically tell cluster API, um, even though the provider doesn't support scale from zero, this is basically the size of the node that will get provisioned in terms of its CPU um, capacity, memory capacity, uh, storage capacity, et cetera, and when you annotate your machine set, for instance, with all of that information, then Cluster API has all the information it needs to understand when to add and remove nodes, um, which is pretty cool. All right, <coughs> let's make them work together. Um, all right, so basically, I have taken a few shortcuts. I have an environment in um, Google Kubernetes Engine that I'll show you here in a moment. And the first thing I'll do is just deploy, I have a single node running in it, and I'm gonna deploy enough pods to create resource pressure. Then we'll watch as Cluster Autoscaler provisions a new node, and subsequently, Descheduler will rebalance pods um, to have an even spread between the two nodes, which wouldn't happen by default. And then we'll update the descheduler config to do the reverse, so basically to bin pack all of our workload. And um, I'll also delete some of the pods that I created to, to initiate that resource pressure. And then we'll watch as the pods are all allocated on a single node and cluster autoscaler deprovisions it. And then lastly, we'll um, write some messages straight to the kernel message log and we'll watch as NPD updates the um, custom conditions that I've configured, and we'll see that in the Google console. Um, might be tricky, okay. Before I start doing things in K9S, I can't see this here, I can only see it there, so that's weird. Um, here's my scale 21x demo cluster. I've got one node, and I'll just show you a few GKE specific things first. Um, there's this concept in GKE of an auto-scaling profile, and by default it won't be set to optimize utilization. This basically means it it tells cluster autoscaler because there's a managed cluster autoscaler that's being um, configured and operated by Google on my behalf, so I didn't have to install it in my cluster. It's as simple as just clicking a button in GKE to enable this feature, and now because I have this profile enabled, it will be aggressive in terms of um, decommissioning and, and commissioning new nodes. It, it just happens faster, so it reduces some of those thresholds. Um, and if I go to the nodes, 
and I click into this default pool. Basically, I'm just trying to show you that it's as easy as the click of a button with with GKE, um, but it's being really slow. Uh, and I've configured it to have a minimum of zero, maximum of three nodes. And instead of having you watch that spinner, I will just move on. Um, so up top here, I'm just showing all the nodes in the cluster. And then down below, I've got all the pods. And <coughs> I've created a bunch of pod disruption budgets. So I mentioned earlier, certain things will not get evicted by default unless you create a PDB. So things in cube system are considered immovable. And so unless you apply these PDBs, then you'll see cluster autoscaler failing to scale down your environment. Um, that's why these are all, are all here. And I've got vScheduler installed and it's running as a cron job. So if I get the cron jobs, you can see it's scheduled to run every one minute. And if we look, I've applied an annotation, which basically says cluster autoscaler should not care about any of these descheduler pods so that you know at, they don't get terminated right away as the jobs complete, so they start to accumulate. And therefore, I just want Cluster Autoscaler to ignore them um, so that it can be as aggressive as possible in decommissioning nodes. And then I've also got NPD running. So I only have one node, and it runs as a daemon set. There we go. So we can see node problem detector is running. And so far, it hasn't really done anything other than it checked for a bunch of conditions and said they're false. So we can see by going back to the nodes and describing this node and going down to its conditions, we can see node problem detector has said, you know, typically you wouldn't see a lot of what we're seeing here, like no corrupt Docker overlay, um, kernel has no deadlock. These are all things that are added by uh, NPD based on the fact that it hasn't detected any problematic um, log lines. And then we have the standard conditions that the kubelet creates, like ready, um, memory pressure, disk pressure, et cetera. And lastly, we have descheduler. Configured via this config map, which is unreadable for humans. Um, so I won't show it to you that way. But. This is the current descheduler config. And I'm not gonna go over it in excruciating detail, but basically I have low node utilization enabled and we have some thresholds. So any node whose total resource consumption falls with um, beneath the specs here, and it has to be for all three, will be considered underutilized. So fewer than 20 pods, less than 100% CPU utilization, less than 10% memory, that's underutilized. And then anything, any node that has all of those same uh, metrics above these values will be considered overutilized. And the, if that's the case, the scheduler will say, um, you know, hey, this node, if it's overutilized, it'll evict pods to try to reschedule them onto um, a less utilized node. So that's what we have now. And I'm going to create some arbitrary workload. And pretty soon here we will see pending pods. So now that these are pending, that's going to trigger cluster autoscaler to scale out the capacity for the node group. We only have one node group, but um, it won't take very long and then we'll have another one and we will change the policy and, and flip it. Well, actually, we'll wait a second to let descheduler balance everything. But 
let's give that a minute and maybe while we wait, this would have loaded. <laughs> yeah. So in Google or GKE, it's as simple as just ticking this box and specifying your threshold. This is sort of similar to the annotations I was showing you for cluster API, but it's just, um, you know, white glove integration. And you can view the cluster autoscaler logs in Google, Google's Log Explorer. What I'm gonna do is hopefully show you the scaling decision that gets made. So what was that? Um, that's hard for me to read from here, but I think that just happened. So is this, can anyone see this? Is this, how's that? Okay, so we just triggered a scale up, cluster autoscaler triggered a scale up because it saw this um, pod that was in pending. And if we go back, yep, it's there. And not only that, but it's actually balanced. So by default, we would have had, you know, 40 some odd pods on that first node, and I apologize because I was being too slow and we missed it, but we can, go back and find it in the event. So if we look for, well, let's just go down to the latest events. So we see a bunch of evictions based off of taints. So these, everything you see here with taint manager eviction, this was descheduler evicting workload because a node was tainted. But let's just go to the descheduler pods and look at some of their logs. So the last one ran a minute ago. Okay, it didn't do anything useful a minute ago. We might have to go further back. Hmm. Well, maybe I'll just show you on the scale down because I was a little too slow. But the gist of it, as you can see, is that this rebalance happened. Um, what I will do now is flip the policy. So if I show you the descheduler high policy, it's just the inverse. We have low node utilization disabled and we have high node utilization enabled. And that will cause the workload that we have currently balanced to become bin packed. So I will apply that. Oh, that's not what I want to do. Um, so that's been reconfigured and then I'll go delete a few of these things. So the high memory and the high CPU, low CPU deployment, I'll just kill completely. So I don't get rid of them, then there'll still be just too much going on in the cluster for it to be deprovisioned. And then the high CPU deployment, I'll just scale it down to one. And what we should see soon is that the cluster autoscaler will add a condition to the node that gets rebalanced and mark it for deletion and it'll get taken down. But this time we'll watch descheduler hopefully do something interesting. So descheduler detected an underutilized node and evicted some pods. And you can see the ratio has shifted and if we give it another minute, that ratio will shift even further. So we have to sit tight for 30 seconds, but um, once the number of pods on the node gets down to about nine, it'll have sufficient, um, the sum of the resource and requests, so the CPU and memory requests on that node will be sufficiently low that it falls beneath the threshold the cluster autoscaler considers it a candidate for deletion. Um, and then another thing we can do is just look at what's on that node. So 
unfortunately for us, these guys won't get considered at all because of the annotation that I added. And then what remains is almost entirely default pods that are gonna be there all the time because it's cube system um, workloads for the control plane. And this is you know, just again to reinforce where the, the PDBs come into play. So if I didn't have the PDBs, this node would be blocked from a scale down event just because these, these workloads are here. But because I do, it was able to update that node. And if I go back, it is starting to kind of thrash a bit, but if we give it another minute, I would say it will um, mark that, that node as a candidate for deletion. And while we wait, I'll just tee up the final thing I wanna show you. Um, before we do that, I'll just show you one more thing, which is some different cluster autoscaler logs, which is sometimes cluster autoscaler isn't making a decision, and you can debug that by expanding. Um, some of these log lines where we see no scale down. So okay, why did no scale down happen? In this case, there was no place to move pods. So that's one example of why a scale down event wouldn't occur. Uh, and this is another example which I didn't touch on earlier, which is that you don't want to ever have pods in your cluster that aren't controlled by a uh, replication controller. So if it's not backed by a deployment or a stateful set, those pods of that nature can also block scale down events because there's no guarantee that workload will get rescheduled. Um, so cluster autoscaler is hesitant to, to take a node down if that type of workload is found. Um, all right. So if there's a pod that's been scheduled on a node that was just an ad hoc pod, like you just did kubectl run nginx or whatever, and it's just one off and it doesn't have a, a parent controller, then there's no way for cluster autoscaler to know if it kills that, if it evicts that pod, will it get recreated? So in that case, it'll not initiate a scale down. that node, the, any node that has that type of, of pod of that type. Um, all right, there we go. Mark the node as to be deleted, and now it has a bunch of different taints, and in a moment here, it'll get deleted, but I won't make you watch and wait. I'll move on. Google's killing my demo. <laughs> um, all right. So I want to make sure I get the one that's not about to get killed. And I'm going to dig into the underlying VM instance and open an SSH connection. Let's just see while we wait. Okay, it's still there. And okay, it's gone. So yeah, changing the policy caused the bin packing to occur and Cluster Autoscaler took that note out. And I will demo one last thing really quickly. I might move on to my like takeaways while we wait for this and then circle back. Um, well, we have 10 minutes. Any questions while we wait? Oh man. <clears throat> this was working like during the last session. I don't know. Oh, here we go. 
totally. Um, so I will elevate, and then over here, I did that earlier. Um, okay, we're gonna tail the NPD logs and we'll just see instantaneously when we write this message into the kernel log that NPD picks it up. And I think I copied some other, no, okay, I got it. So I basically simulated a kernel panic, or sorry, a kernel deadlock, and NPD picked that up. So obviously this is contrived, but um, if that happened, NPD would have noticed and if we go to the node and look at its conditions, it now has kernel deadlock true. And if we cut back over to Google, we can actually see that got surfaced in their UI. And now things are not good. Um, so that's just you know one example of what you can do with NPD. And shortly here, in a few months, hopefully we'll be able to apply um, taints to nodes um, directly based off of conditions created by NPD and then Descheduler can act on those taints. All right. So we want stable Kubernetes clusters, and there's a lot of things getting in the way of us achieving that, but there's also a lot of ways we can achieve it. It just takes understanding a lot of these Kubernetes primitives and the pieces in, available to us in the ecosystem. So configuring things like NPD, Descheduler, and Cluster Autoscaler can get us there, um, and we should be proactive by understanding how to configure these tools and, and understanding what they have to offer. Um, if we combine that with pod disruption budgets, resource quotas, uh, and limit ranges, we will have hopefully a more robust cluster. And then lastly, uh, if we can leverage the power of the API server to provision our clusters declaratively using cluster API, then I think we're in a really awesome place. And shameless plug, that's what we do at Spectro Cloud. So um, we're a Kubernetes management platform. We have an abstraction called a cluster profile, which you see here, which models the, the cluster. Um, including Descheduler, Cluster Autoscaler, cluster auto and NPD. And you can deploy this with the click of a button to basically any cloud. Um, so it's built on CAPI though, which is our, we contribute, we upstream a lot of stuff to the various CAPI providers like CAPI vSphere, um, the cluster API provider for Maz we contributed. Um, so if you're interested in CAPI and auto scaling, um, that's us. And thanks for your time. Uh, thanks, Tyler. Does anybody have any questions? I've got one. Um, is it possible to implement your own custom plugins to do these health checks of things that are running in the cluster or even health checks for cluster nodes if they're on like physical uh, hardware, for example? Yeah, so NPD's custom plugin, um, cu custom monitor plugin, I believe, just supports any shell script. So if the shell script exits with this particular status, it'll set a particular condition to either true or false. So um, you can do that with NPD, and then descheduler is also highly extensible. Like I just showed the six out of the box um, default policies, but you can write your own. Um, and cluster autoscaler, mm, not so much. But yeah, there are ways you can, you know, Everything with Kubernetes is kind of one of the cool things about it is it's very extensible. Okay, anybody else got a question? Okay, join me in thanking uh, Tyler for a great presentation.